Good morning. This is Action News Jack Sunday. Good morning. It's Sunday, February 3rd, 2019. Welcome to Action News Jack Sunday. I'm Paige Kelton. Ted Bundy was arguably one of America's most notorious serial killers. He made Jacksonville one of his final hunting grounds. A new Netflix documentary and a soon to be released movie on Ted Bundy has renewed interest in the charismatic killer who terrorized women in seven states. Ted Bundy's youngest and final victim was 12 year old Kimberly Diane Leach of Lake City. This morning, Action News Jack's Bridget Matter sat down with Bob Deekle, the lead prosecutor who brought Bundy to justice and witnessed his execution for his brutal crime. So take me back to February of 1978. My wife had just delivered our third child and I was driving to the uh, hospital to visit her. I heard on the radio that a uh, young girl had gone missing from Lake City Junior High School. And uh, I said to myself at that point, uh, well, she's either run away and uh, she'll be home in a few days, or she has been snatched by one of these roam around the country, kill at random mass murderers, and we'll never know what happened to her. What was Lake City like during her disappearance? During her disappearance, uh, it was a madhouse. Uh, there were, right at the very beginning, there were hundreds of, uh, uh, seemed like to me, I might be exaggerating, uh, of people involved in the, uh, in the search effort. How many days went by until her body was found? Um, her body was found in April. I don't remember just exactly the date. It was about two months later, two months after the uh, uh, after she disappeared, that her body was found. And where was her body found? It was found in a wooded area um, just off of Stagecoach Road in Swanee County, right near the Swanee River State Park. Why do you think Ted Bundy targeted Kimberly Leach? Uh, well, she was a target of opportunity. Um, she was a, uh, he had uh, tried to kidnap a young girl in um, Jacksonville the day before. And uh, that little girl was very lucky because about the time Bundy approached her, uh, and was beginning to uh, talk to her. Uh, her brother drove up in his pickup truck, and her brother um, looked like Man Mountain Dean, and um, he hollered at Bundy and said, hey, what are you doing with my sister? And Bundy says, um, uh, nothing, I made a mistake. And he runs and jumps his car and takes off. And the brother loads his sister up and chases Bundy, gets his, uh, gets his license tag. Doesn't catch him, loses him in traffic. If he'd caught him, I don't think Kim would have been kidnapped the next morning. Talk to me about the kidnapping and, and the series of events um, when he got a hold of her. Bundy had been patrolling or trolling back and forth in front of the, uh, the uh, junior high that morning as classes were letting in and the people were coming, you know, kids were being let off, dropped off to go to school. And uh, uh, he was obviously still there, still circling the, the campus when he saw Kim walking alone across the, uh, across the, uh, the, the campus. Now, target of opportunity, uh, Tandy Bonner would have been a target of opportunity also. Why didn't he take Tandy instead of Kim? Um, Kim fit a profile, a preferred profile for, uh, for victims. He cut her throat, we believe, with a uh, gigantic hunting knife that he purchased in uh, Jacksonville the day before. 
Coming up on Action News Jack Sunday, Deagle tells us about the key piece of evidence used to convict Bundy of Kimberly Leach's murder, and he shares his eyewitness account of Ted Bundy's execution. Welcome back to Action News Jack Sunday. Four days after he kidnapped and killed 12 year old Kimberly Leach in Lake City, Ted Bundy was arrested in a chance encounter with an officer in Pensacola. Our conversation continues now with the lead prosecutor in Leach's murder. He talks about how they linked Bundy to the girl's death. Let's go to the trial. Tell me the highlights of the trial. We started off the trial and uh, things Things didn't go well for a few days at the trial. Uh, we had shaky eyewitness identifications. It was discouraging the first week. And uh, there was a bailiff. I always like to do reality checks with, uh, with the, uh, uh, when I'm trying a case. And um, court personnel are good people to do reality checks with. And so there was a bailiff there named Alex. And every afternoon I'd do a reality check with Alex. And I'd say, Alex, how we do it? And every day I'd go to Alex and I'd say, Alex, how we do it? And he'd say, you ain't showed me nothing yet. And finally, uh, we got to the, um, uh, got to the uh, scientific evidence. I started putting scientific evidence on. And I went to Alex, uh, and I said, Alex, how we doing? And he says, you're doing a little better now. Okay. So well, we better be doing a little better. We only got one more day of testimony to go. So the next day we put on Lynn Henson, who was our fiber analyst. And, uh, and as she talked about the various transfers, she put the transfer on the poster, and when we got through with the uh, with the uh, with the transfers, got through with all the transfers, and you got the poster completely done, I was walking on air. I was elated because I felt like we had uh, I felt like we had uh, kicked a touchdown, knocked a home run. Uh, I could not wait at the end of the day to go, go and ask Alex, Alex, how we do it? And he said, you're over the top. And I said, all right. What did you think of him? Uh, I did not know what a perverted, degraded, slime ball he was until years after. I did not have a full knowledge of the depths of his depravity until I talked to Bob Hagmeyer with the FBI Behavioral Sciences Unit. How did you feel when he was convicted? I was elated. I worked for two years uh, of my life to uh, get to that point. And uh, I, uh, you know, I managed to uh, maintain my composure until after the, uh, after the court recessed. But uh, it was, uh, we got away from the uh, news media and the cameras, it was high fives. Did you go to his execution? I was there. Just about all of the witnesses were men who had worked on the case. Uh, so I saw a lot of men that I hadn't seen in a long time. And it was kind of like a uh, family reunion. You know, it was, uh, it was uh, a uh, kind of a happy time, you know. It was, uh, we we were we were all there. We were all happy. Uh, it was good to see you, and we filed into uh, 
into the uh, the death chamber itself, into the viewing room. And the viewing room was a uh, uh, a little room that was separated from the actual death chamber with um, a, a glass partition. The curtain opens, and you see the death chamber, and there sits old Sparky uh, right in the middle of the chamber. Off to the left, there's kind of a half wall, and a guy standing behind it with a hood over his head, black hood. Door came open, and in walked two burly guards, uh, one on each of Bundy's arms. And he come walking in, and he looked like he was scared, slammed to death. He looked white as a sheet. Uh, the the guy who loved to be in control was in control of absolutely nothing at that point except his emotions. And he was doing a pretty good job of controlling his emotions, and that was all. Uh, they brought him over to the uh, to the chair. They put him, sat him down in the chair, and they strapped him down. Um, they asked him if he had any final words, and he said a few words. Uh, he got through saying his say, and then they strapped him back and dropped the hood over him. And uh, guy on the phone did the high side, gave the high side. And they threw the switch. And uh, you could tell where the switch was thrown because his hands tensed, made fists. And Bundy, whenever he made a fist, he'd make a fist with his thumbs between his, uh, between his fingers like this. So he had both hands, he'd make a fist with his thumbs between his, between his fists like this. And as his hands were tightening like that, the thought that was running through my mind was, I wonder how many throats those hands have tightened around. How did you feel after that? Uh, John Stewart said something right after the death of Osama bin Laden that epitomizes the way I felt. Uh, Stewart said, I hope that I am never this happy again over the death of another human being. 